In this edition of Generations, we talk to some very special people, our military veterans, as 2019 commemorates the 75th anniversary of D-Day and the 77th anniversary of the Battle of Midway. We have men and women from the Army, Navy and Submarine Service with us to tell their stories. And Judy Jenks from SeniorCenterCT.org talks about veteran benefits and why you need to stay up to date on them and what you're entitled to. Hello, I'm Brian Scott-Smith and welcome to Generations, a new podcast for people of your generation. 2019 commemorates two significant military moments in world history – the 75th anniversary of D-Day and the beginning of the end of World War II, and the 77th anniversary of the Battle of Midway, a decisive naval battle between the US and Japan. Talking with us are three American military veterans who share some of their memories and stories about their time in the military service. Dick Elliott is 91 years old and served in the Navy as well as the submarine service. Marilyn Charette is 84 and was a civilian nurse in the military and also had a husband in the Navy service. And Ron Roderick Sr. is 83 years old and served in the U.S. Army Medical Corps. With Ladies First, Marilyn starts off the conversation. Well, it was my husband was in the Navy for 28 years. And um, most of that time he was away and under the water. He was on submarines. And so I had to deal with being alone most of the time with three little kids. Um, but we did, we did fine. And they always waited for Daddy to come home. <laughs> and the first tour that he went on when I had my daughter was, well, when he left, she was one. He came back. He, she was almost two. And I went down the pier with the stroller, and he looked at her, and he says, Who's that? <laughs> He didn't, so it was not good. <laughs> but um, I, as I said, was not in the Navy myself. However, I was the visiting nurse for the Navy, for the Navy personnel. And for 10 years, and I loved that job. It was great. Obviously a very busy job. And you said you're a mum as well. Your husband was away. Right. Uh, how did you juggle all of that? It must have been quite difficult. Um, well, for a while I had my mother living with me, which was great. And then um, they were old enough to to not leave alone. I never left him alone, but um, to understand that Daddy was gone, but he was coming back. And so they went on about their way and invented things to keep him busy, and I did too, and... They were fine. We also have two gentlemen here with us as well, uh, Dick Elliott and Ron Roderick. Dick, you also were in the Navy. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I was uh, one of these people that uh, I enlisted to be patriotic, but uh, I was uh, 17 in June of '45. And so that's when I went in, and it was all over in October. So, uh, and actually, uh, today I think is VJ Day, if I'm not mistaken, or, or it was yesterday or today. So uh, I didn't really uh, see that much of it, but uh, I went into uh, uh, the Navy and went through boot camp and, and then went uh to what we call the amphibious section of the Navy. And uh, we went into training for the invasion of Japan, but naturally that that didn't come about because uh, it it was all over, like I say, in August. So uh, then I went into, uh, I have what we call broken service. when you go in during the war, you mostly go in uh, to the reserves. So you go in and you get out by points. So uh, my uh, ID card said DOA, uh, expiration DOA, duration of the emergency. So when I got the points, I got out. And uh, uh, 
went to uh, uh, electronics school, and I liked that, and uh, got into electronics, and then went back into the Navy, and and they uh, had a reenlistment type deal, where if if you had some experience, uh, you could request what you wanted to do, and so I requested electronics school, and within a couple uh, uh, weeks. They uh, sent me to electronics school up at Great Lakes, Illinois, and that was almost a year. And I went aboard the USS Mississippi, which was an old converted battle wagon, and uh, but it was converted into uh, uh, new electronics and and new fire control systems and so forth. So I got a lot of experience right off the bat and uh, tried to get into the submarine service, but I didn't have any back molars. And at that time, they had an escape procedure with what they called a Monson lung, which had a, a mouthpiece to where you clamp down on it. Well, I didn't have anything to clamp down on, so I couldn't get into the submarine service. But uh, once I was uh, in electronics and was in the Navy for a while, I went to guided missile school. Well, it just so happens that uh, after a period of time in shore duty, uh, they did away with the Munson lung and went to what they call uh, uh, blow and go. So then I could, uh, I, uh, one of the officers that I had was a submarine officer that was on the ship that I was on, and he found out that I was trying to get into submarine service, so he helped me get into submarine service. So, so you finally made it. So I finally found it and got into submarines, yeah. And how many years were you in submarines? Well, 14. Uh, well, let's see, six, almost 16, yeah. Okay. So, we, we're going to come back and talk to you a little sure. bit more about that in a second because I want to obviously um, speak to, to Ron. Ron, again, thank you for being here and on the podcast. Army Medical Corps, tell us a little bit more about that because, again, a different type of the service. I want to go a medic because I knew a lot about doing things up with people. And I was always in the in boats and everything. Being a commercial fisherman, I like to help people. I like the service. <laughs> and it sounds like you, we were talking before we started recording this, and it sounds like you moved a, around a little bit, started in New Jersey, I think you told me, yeah, went yeah. to Massachusetts. I started in, in New Jersey. I went from New Jersey... I went to medical school. And then I went to Fort at Devon's Mass. Let's talk a little bit more just, you know, generally about, you know, your memories of, of things. I mean, like, you know, Dick, you said you, you joined the service and it's sort of like everything seemed to was, was coming to an end. I mean, but, you know, what were your memories before then, you know, looking back about, you know, the conflicts that were going on? I mean, as a young man... What were your thoughts and your memories of, of back then? Growing up, you always have an idea of what you want to do when you get older. What made me uh, make up my mind to do certain things was due to the fact that the war was going on. So that was the big motive. Was And, and I had an older brother that was, went into the Navy. Uh, had a sister that went into the waves. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we were kind of a Navy family. Everything at that time was uh, uh, trying to get through uh, different ways and going through uh, um, times when you had to have coupons to go to get things like gasoline and, and uh, different things. Sugar, sugar was rationed, and gasoline was rationed, and so forth. So uh, it was a different way of life. Uh, it made you think about... Uh, the benefits that we had, and uh, you read in the in the paper and so forth, and on the news, you always heard about what was happening in Europe and uh, what the English were putting up with and so forth. So that was uh, more or less what uh, steered you where you were going to go eventually. So. Um, Marilyn, same question to you. You know your memories as a young lady. Uh, and a mother, you know, and a wife. Just talk to us a little bit about that as well, some oh. of your memories, because it's fascinating to people because we don't understand that now, um, you know, as a generation. Right. Um, it was very it's very exciting for me. I was a young 
Navy bride. I was only 19 when we got married. And but I had known him since I was 14, so it was, you know, girls made sailor die, <laughs> Mary moves away from home. It wasn't like that. But my husband was very fortunate. He was, he um, went up the ladder very quickly, and he went in as a senior, as a what do they call seamen recruits, seamen recruits, and he came out a commander. So he did quite a quite a bit. And um, there were two particular incidences that I remember. The first one was when um, he was assigned to the Pentagon, and um, he was the United, made the United States representative to NATO. Um, you think NATO is an organization now? I don't know, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. That's the one. But I don't know. Yeah. But he was the United States. And we had to give um, parties for the visiting ambassadors and everything. Not in our home, but in the, in the, the, the studio. And we, we, he had, you know, a, a just wide open budget that we could do. So you must have met some quite extraordinary some people. wonderful people, yeah. And that was the one... And the second one that I think was a little more current, but I don't know if anybody knows about it anymore, is the Nautilus, the USS Nautilus. That, that went out. He was a crew member for both trips, or well, really for three trips, because two they tried, and the third one they finally made it. So he was, he was the sonarman on board that. So when you talk about the Nautilus, yes. I'm assuming you mean... The submarine, which is now here in Groton, Correct. at the Submarine Correct. Museum. Correct. So your husband was on that submarine for four years. Yeah. So when you look at that submarine, it must have a, a huge amount of memories for you, even though you didn't serve on it, but your your husband did. Seeing it there preserved. Well, on that boat it was completely different. The the wives were totally in, included in the non classified things that were going on. Classified, no, they held those back, but any of the non-classified things, they, they let the wives in on everything. When they were going to the North Pole on the second try, uh, the captain had a plane to bring him back to Washington. He had to meet with General Eisenhower and the others, and he says, I'm not going on that empty plane by myself, I want as many men as can go, wants to go and go on that ship. So he brought all the husbands back. We didn't know they were coming. We had no idea. We hadn't heard from them. And I was I'm from Newport, and I was in Newport visiting my mother that day. And <clears throat> He, he, got, he called me. He says, where are you? I said, I'm in Newport at my mother's. She says, well, you get your tail back here now. <laughs> <laughs> so they came back for 48 hours, and then they went on the trip. But it was very secretive. Nobody knew anything of what they were doing. Yeah. Out there. Wow, that's incredible. So that, those are two standouts that we had. My great memories. They are. Uh, Let's get back to you, young Ron. Tell us about, you know, your, some of your memories, you know, um, you know, maybe like growing up and, and what was happening and, you know, how it made you feel. Growing up, mm. I was in the hospital most of the time. Yeah? I had uh, polio. Oh, wow. Okay, polio, which is something which is eradicated now. Polio, uh, infantile paralysis. Yeah, so uh, I didn't go to school much. I was in the hospital most of the time. We are a very fortunate country. Uh, one of the things that I found out from traveling in different places in Europe and so forth is how lucky we are. Uh, we have, we don't, we have a choice in as far as electing different officials. They might not go the way we want them to go, but at least uh, we have a choice. And. Uh, I think that's one of the benefits that all the Americans have that uh, that other countries don't have. 
we are very for, very fortunate, and that was one of the reasons why I went into the service is to make sure that we we stayed that way. Sure. And Marilyn, I mean, you children. I mean, what do your children think of not only yourself, obviously their mom, um, their dad. I mean, you know, what are what are some of the things that maybe they've had discussions with you about? They have discussions a lot about what is he doing, why is he doing. I couldn't answer them because I didn't know myself. And my husband told me the same thing. He says, I'm sorry. He says, I don't mean any disrespect, but I cannot tell you what I'm doing. And I realized that that was it. And when he, whatever he said was final. And um, that's what I relayed to the children. They understood um, did it make that difficult sometimes, obviously? Sometimes it did. Sometimes at night when they come in, they take turns bringing their pillows and their blankets in to sit by, to sleep by the side of my bed. And that was very soothing to them. General Eisenhower, I met him before, that was before he was president. He came in after Truman. What did you think about him? I thought he was a great man. He was very interested in his his crew, his his group of people, and he is very very kind to other people who we'd see. You also mentioned another world leader at the time, De Gaulle. De Gaulle. What was yeah. he like? Very military-ish. I was just with him for a few minutes. We were in the receiving line, and there was a lull in the line for some reason. He happened to be the one next to me that was. I was standing in the receiving line. But he was very, let's get this line moving type of thing. (laughs) So he wasn't a particularly patient man then from the sales? No, no, not to, maybe he he was with his his group, I don't know, but no, not to stand in waiting lines, (laughs) he didn't want anything like that. And Dick, anyone for you that you suddenly springs to mind? The one that made the most impression out of me was... uh, Admiral Rickover, like I say, he was he was different. <laughs> he was a different individual. We were very fortunate. We had a chief torpedo man that was the same size as Rickover, so he would donate his uniform while Rickover was on board. But he was a he was an intelligent man, but he was a little kinky uh, as yeah. far as uh, the way that he treated people and Not so nice. forth. It was yeah. not nice. But uh, one of the <laughs> questions that he asked officers that he was interviewing was, how many belt loops do you have in your pants? <laughs> and it's a, Five. you didn't count them when you put your belt on because he was a nut for details. But he figured that you should know how many belt loops because you put your belt on every morning, you know. Well, trousers have different numbers of belt loops, I've found out. (laughs) He was a different individual. Uh, One of the things in submarines, I think, I mean, we, we, um, it's a different Navy. I was in the, uh, in the surface craft, uh, surface Navy for uh, a few years. And, uh, it's just a different organization, really is. Uh, submarine people are, uh, the reason, I think, is the fact that uh, submariners, when they qualify, they can be anywhere on the submarine, and if emergency happens, they know what to do because they know where everything is and, and what, how the systems work and the whole bit. And you don't run into that in surface craft. In surface craft, they have their own little bailiwick, you know, if, if you know what I'm saying. Mm. So submariners are a different breed, and, and uh, they're closer. They're a lot closer. Is it, is it because of the nature of the service, because it is so secret, the work well, that you Well, not so secret, them? but you have to depend on each other. And the dependence on each other, I think, it, it, you get to know each other and... and uh, Every, you know that everybody else knows their job. What message do you want to leave the world today 
and it can be anything you want is you know is there a piece of advice a piece of wisdom is there something that you would like to leave as a message to people listening to this i would say um for the younger generation my message is please 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 remember peace and love and i think if we get back to that and honesty i think that's very important and um when when we were young it was so patriotic i was at the end of world war 2 but everybody was just so patriotic and so kind and giving to who never it was that's sort of gone by the wayside but i'd like to that to come back that's a great message dick i'm a flag, a flag waver <laughs> yeah. uh I really believe in this country. I think the uh, new generation, like you say, if they believe in this country and uh, uh, the way that we live, to have them look around and see uh, the benefits that we have and, and stay patriotic. I love this country. I hope everybody else does. Well, to the three of you, our veterans, thank you ever so much again for joining us on Generations. And again, thank you for your service that you gave to your country. Thank you. So joining us as ever is uh, Judy Jenks from SeniorCenterCT.org. Judy, lovely to see you. Lovely to see you as well. Veterans Benefits. Yes, and, and I wanted to talk about your veteran benefits because if you've served in the military and have an honorable discharge, your level of VA benefits varies according to a whole lot of factors. When you served, where you served, how long you were in, plus other details. But the good news is there is somebody out there waiting to help you figure out which benefits you're entitled to. And I use the word entitled because they are your benefits. You earn them by serving and you deserve them. And remember, things are always changing. So if you asked about your VA benefits when you first get out or five years ago, even last year, ask again because a lot of factors have changed. I mentioned having an honorable discharge, and even that has been re-looked at. Uh, Also, depending on your service, you might be entitled to things somebody else doesn't get or they get something you can't get. And regardless, there is help out there for all veterans. Depending on where you live is where you need to go. A great starting point is the VA website. It's super easy to find. It's va.gov. So it's va.gov. Go to the website and poke around. It's jam-packed with information for you. Uh, Also, you can go and check out out your uh, senior center, your town hall, and they could possibly point you in the right direction. Call your senator and representative. They can help you as well. And here in Connecticut, each town has a veterans representative trained to help all veterans. There are VA clinics and VA hospitals, plus a growing number of veteran coffee houses. Um, Ask for guidance. Stop in and talk with the folks. Share your story. Remember to visit uh, va.gov for the website. Make some phone calls. They're waiting to help you. It's all great advice as usual. And you're absolutely right about rechecking your benefits because things change. Yes, and, and they change faster than we realize. Um, anybody that has had a bad experience with the VA in any way, you need to revisit them because things have changed dramatically. Now, you're a younger lass <laughs> than our veterans who we have just been uh, speaking to, but you must have some memories yourself, family memories, I'm sure, even if you didn't have uh, military personnel in the family. I mean, you know, things that were going on in the world at the time. I, I wasn't here at that time. <laughs> I know, I know. But, <laughs> but I, mean... I do have a lot of memories about Vietnam. My my brother was in Vietnam, and then my future husband that I hadn't met was in Vietnam. So um, I, I was one of those baby boomers. I was, you know, of the hippie age and the protests and all of that. So um, that's really where my recollections really start. Um, I do remember as a very small child standing out on Long Hill in Groton, and there was some sort of parade, some sort of procession, and Truman went by when he was president. But, you know, that's that's like my earliest memory of any of that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, I didn't have any family who were directly in the military, but... Um, you know, they obviously all helped out in the war effort, as obviously, you know, civilians uh, do. And and um, my mother's father 
was a farmer. So, of course, they were critical, um, uh, you know, uh, a critical part of the, the war effort. And, um, you know, she, she recalls a lot of, uh, of things that, you know, he would have to do and visit. So, like, you know, basically army uh, camps in the, in the United Kingdom. But the biggest thing that, that I recall, and even my mother sort of and my, and my dad sort of um, remember a bit, is rationing, which Dick, yes. which Dick yes. mentioned in, you know, mm-hmm. earlier. And, you know, going from a time when you could just go down the shop and just buy anything to a time when that was not possible right. and you had to have these little coupons or these little you know, pieces of paper and you were limited to the amount of sugar you could have. And it just seems so incredibly unreal to people of my age and younger that, what, you couldn't go to the shop and buy stuff? Yes. Uh, my mother, they were in their teens uh, during World War II. Her sister was a diabetic, so their rationing was very different because she was a diabetic, so they were able to have things other people could not have because of the rationing. And then when I was in in the senior center, um, I remember this one story that this one woman told, and uh, Rita would talk about what it was like during World War II because she had a baby and her husband was away. And one of the things that she desperately wanted was a washing machine. So she saved her coupon, she traded coupon, she worked, she did everything she could, finally accomplished having everything she needed to get that washing machine and went to buy one and there were no washing machines to be had because of the war effort. Yeah, because all so of they, the metal was being yes. used for you know for, for military purposes. Yeah, so she didn't get a washing machine during World War Two. It is just absolutely yeah. incredible, you know, when you hear stories like that. As I said, for us now, even though sadly we still live in a world full of conflict, but you know, those sorts of things just, just don't occur and, and, you know, are just unheard of or, you know, unimaginable to the generations today. And, and, and sadly, like uh, even now, but uh, during Iraq and Afghanistan, so many Americans didn't even realize we were at war. Mm. And when you would mention something about that, you know, people would be taken aback that we're not at war. It's like, yes, we are. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. But one thing I suppose that did come out of of all of this, apart from obviously peace, which obviously is the most important thing, is the nations were probably healthier because of rationing, because you couldn't indulge in, you know, huge amounts of, you know, fats and sugars and whatever, because that was one thing that I remember – you know, my mum saying, she said, oh, yeah, we, we, we all seemed a lot healthier because we didn't have anything. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought of that, but I bet you're right. Yeah, yes. I mean, you know. And when, so do we need rationing now? Well, it probably wouldn't be a bad thing, would it? I guess, I mean, you know, we do live in a world of indulgence, don't we? But, I yes. mean, she distinctly remembers, you know, that she said, you know, like, even for birthdays, if you wanted, a, like, a birthday cake, you know, you had to save up the eggs and things. Oh, yes. you know, you, again, it was, these things had to be planned. Yes, and they did a lot of planning and a lot of, you know, swapping of the, the rationing tickets or what, even gas. You yeah. know, they, they, they weren't free to go as often as they wanted to wherever because they had a limited amount of gas. Yeah, incredible stuff. Well, they were great stories from our veterans, and it's been, you know, a really interesting different episode of yes. Generations, but yes. it was an important one uh, mm-hmm. to do, obviously, to recognize the uh, the service of the men and women of the world's, you know, so like military and, and uh, obviously the service of the U.S. military as well. So it's been a good one. And I think that it will get people thinking in a different way. And for some of our older seniors, they will be having memories that maybe they've forgotten. Absolutely. Judy, as always, it's great having you. We will catch you next episode. Okay, thank you very much. That's all from this edition of Generations. Don't forget to visit SeniorCentreCT.org to find out what's going on in your neck of the woods. And if you want to send us a topic to talk about or want to be our guest on the podcast, drop us a line by visiting the SeniorCentreCT.org website Go to the bottom of the homepage and click the How to Advertise with us link to get in touch. From myself, Brian Scott-Smith, thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time.